Rotherham uh, representatives of the Fans Forum who can give you a bit more information about tonight and a bit more information about what the Fans Forum is all about. Certainly better qualified to do so than me. So please welcome our first two guests. They are from the Fans Forum, Nick Murnock and Lewis Owen. <laughs> You've just walked right through live television with two <laughs> bottles of Chang. <laughs> Couldn't help yourself, could you? Um, Nick, I'll start with you as the, uh, the chair of the Fans Forum. Just tell us a little bit about the background of, of this event and what, you, what you're out to achieve. Okay, um, what we've been doing as part of building up with the forum is, is it clearly uh, as, as, as working with all our supporters and, and trying to ensure that we, we, we find all the information that people want us to br bring to the club and to get answers, then the best way was to try and get us all together. I mean, I think everyone loves coming to Goodison Park at any time for any occasion. And what we said with the club is, well, we need more opportunities to get people in. So myself and Lewis can pinch five minutes with you all and say, this is who we are. This is the fans forum, and if there's any issues around being a fan of Everton Football Club, then come and speak to us, and we'll do our best. If you've got ideas around things need to change, you need to speak to us, and we'll take that forward. So an ideal way, Darren, was, was to put more of these events on so that we can get to meet people in the right environment. I know a little bit, I've said it's a bit like a timeshare situation. You sort of bring you in, give you a bit of a hard sell, and then you give you a decent night for the last half an hour or so. So hopefully it's not that bad, but um, it, that's the plan. Um, with regards to t tangible success for the Fans Forum, you've been already involved in quite a few projects working alongside the Football Club Loose. Yeah, and I think that's uh, that's important. I think the, the, the remit really for us is obviously to be the voice of the fans, um, so where we can be the voice of, a, of, the, of the match game fan and, and other fans around the world as well, we'll try and be that. Um, but yeah, the projects that we've been involved in, um, the one main one at the moment for us is the stadium branding project. and. In terms of the interior of that and the concourses, hopefully you'll see some of that in action. And um, you know, please do let us know your feedback on that. And I think what was what was good about that in particular was that we did engage with the fans um, on that, and you would have seen some activity around that. So um, you know, we've really gone out and and got views on that. <clears throat> uh, and and I think that was a prime example of of how we can uh, work with the club and also on behalf of the fans to to form a you know a tangible. Um, project and uh, and make a difference to to the experience of Goodison. Makes a real difference that Nick, doesn't it? Because you've got to show the people out there that you're not just here in name only. It is working. It is working, um, and it was always going to get take a little bit of time. I think when I picked up the uh, the chairmanship, you know, I went round and spoke to people and said, you know, how's it been for you? And and we 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 had to take, to be fair, some constructive criticism. And there were views that well, you're just there as nodding dogs, aren't you? You know, you're just going to do what the club says. And 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 genuinely, and I hope people begin to see there is some issue now that we are challenging the club. I mean, over the season ticket prices for this season, we were very very clear that 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 people had to be able to afford. To to come to Goodison Park. That was a key. If, if, if you cut the lifeblood off, and that was, people have noticed, sort of the issues around concessions between 18 and 21. People don't earn good salaries when they're 18. They go to university, if they're under sort of apprenticeships. We needed to ensure that the club priced that at the right level so that people could afford to come. And it's the same with the cup games. We, we've had some debate, and if I'm honest, we haven't always agreed. We didn't agree over the pricing of the European games. OK, we live and learn from that experience, and now hopefully people are seeing the benefits of £5 kids tickets for the uh, the League Cup games to date, and, and, and there is a lot of good movement going forward, but it will take time. You know, we can't change everything. We are, if you like, a, a group that influences on behalf of the fans, but at the end of the day, the club has the, is, is, isn't the final arbiter, but certainly it, it clearly is, and genuinely say that, it, it's a two-way process. The club listens, and we're hoping to see more of the outcomes as we move on this season. What are the main themes, Lewis? What are the main groups of questions that you tend to get, or the main queries that you get, or the main points that you get that you want outsiders want you can, to can put we get the wi -Fi? football club? Can we get Wi-Fi at the club? Uh, we, we, that's, that's the main question we get. Which, by the way, you know, we're, we're at the football game. We don't need access to, to Wi-Fi. Uh, that's my view on it. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's, there's obviously lots of different reoccurring questions that we get asked. Um, sort of some more trivial, should we say, than others. Um, but I think with the, the hard pressing matters, we try and uh, sort of get answers where we can. And obviously, it's not as easy as just walking into a meeting and, and demanding an answer there and then. Um, we have to do a little bit more careful in how we operate but um, I suppose the whole piece is really if you have any have any 
Tin as a fan, you want to raise, we, we're there to, to go and ask that question. So please do you know, get involved on Twitter. We're on Twitter, and that's probably our main channel um, of interaction with fans. Uh, EFC underscore fans forum is the, the Twitter handle, so to reach out there. Um, and that's that's really sort of the main way of getting in touch, um, aside other other areas as well. I'm not sure if I missed something there, Nick. Um, I think it's just to sorry, Lewis, just just, just to re-emphasise that that we are only as strong as, as as yourselves contacting us and letting us know. A, a big thing that's been floating around over the last month is around away ticket allocation. Um, that's probably split the fan base down the middle. Around does the current system work? Is there a better way of doing it? But the only way we can do it is to, is to ask you for your opinion. It's not down to us to change it from our own perspective. So we need that interaction. So as Lewis says, watch the Twitter site, watch the fan sites, and you know let's keep that communication going because there are some pretty interesting subjects. One that Tony might be a little bit interested in when he comes on later around people have said we should use his version of Z cars that he used for his fight rather than the current version of Z cars that's been used. And we've had an interesting debate on Twitter about that as well. But that's what we want. We need that interaction with you. We 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 are not able to operate with any real power unless we know what the fans want. Just finally, Nick, if somebody's out there listening to this thinking, I wouldn't mind being a part of this fans forum, Lark, what's the way forward? Okay, the way forward is, is to keep a little eye on the website. Um, as we're hoping next week, we will put out the details around how you can become involved. What happens is there is an election each year. People serve a term on the fans forum. Once that finishes, then we bring new people on. So each year, we bring a number of new people onto the forum so that we get new ideas, we get new focuses, and we get in sort of different opinions. So if people are minded to do so, then on the website, we'll come an application form. We'll give you a bit of details, more details about what, what the forum does, what we ask you to do, is just give us your views around what you would bring to the table, what, what you're good at, what you know about, and why you think that you could bring something to this working group that we have with the football club. Put your application form in, and we'll take it through from there, and we, we'd, we'd love to get applications off as many people. But certainly, this, this is a, a mouthpiece for the fans, so we have to make sure it's representative. So if you fancy coming and getting involved, we'd love to receive an application from you. And there are also several representatives of the Fans Forum in here tonight as well who will be more than happy to answer questions after this event is finished. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, Nick and Lewis from the Fans Forum. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys. Right, without any further ado, please welcome our two principal guests this evening. In no, uh, no order, Ian Snowden and Tony Bellew. Are you talking to Snods or Tony then? <laughs> um, just to reiterate, gentlemen, we are live. <laughs> Welcome aboard, but we are live. There's only one place to start, and that's with you, Tony, and that's with this okay. fantastic belt here, which has now got Tony Bellew's picture on it as well, where it will remain forevermore. Uh, an Evertonian world champion. How good does that sound, by the way? Not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with the night at Goodison Park. It was. Uh, it's still difficult for you to put into words just what the whole scenario was like. It is. It, it doesn't seem real. Uh, it seemed real when I came back for the Tottenham game. It seemed a little more, little bit more real. Uh, I, I don't know. I can't put it into words. Besides the fact that I was blown away, uh, the noise, the noise. It, it'll stay with me forever in that dressing room. And I always remember making a few little girly demands before before I agreed the events and one of the demands was I have to have the home dressing room, no ifs or buts, no one goes in before, no one touches me space and uh, and the other one was I just need a box for me, me son and me missus and me family to come and, and they're not allowed to stand on the front when I walk to the ring, which didn't get obeyed, uh, but not never does in our house when she's talking. <laughs> so I just, they, they were the, the demands that I wanted and uh, I don't know, just the noise, the noise of the fans when I was in that dressing room warming up. I switched the music off, which has never, ever been done for any fight ever I've had before. The music's usually so loud, no one can hear anyone speak. But with 20 minutes to go, I said, turn it off. And I just listened to the fans singing my name and singing Everton songs. And I remember looking at Fran and just saying, I've dreamed of this. I've dreamed of it. And then I took the walk. Makes it sound so easy, doesn't it? 
<laughs> Snodds, what, what diva demands did you have on the night? Because you clearly enjoyed yourself. <laughs> we certainly did. Uh, me and Diamond, we were... Uh, I were that close, I were nearly vasling Tony's eyebrows at one stage, but uh, yeah, me and, uh, me and Diamond went and we had a few drinks, went to the Wimslow and watched all the bouts, watched the Smith Brothers, even though they are Reds, they're great lads, and Tony will agree with that, I, I've got time for them all, so uh, we watched all the bouts, but by the time Tony came in, uh, I would say Graham were more worse the way than I were. But uh, no, the, the atmosphere, uh, just to see him come out, I, I go to all his fights if I can, uh, especially down at the Echo. Uh, he is a top, top Evertonian who gives all the boys all, all his support, so why shouldn't we give us all, his, uh, all our support to him when he's fighting on this big occasion that it were at Goodison Park? And uh, yeah, it, after the first knockdown in the first round, I've kind of looked and looked at Diamond and thought, no, please. But then, second round, he... he let's go, you thought, he yeah. stays. <laughs> Forget um, this. Let's get to Wimslow. We'll get another few bites in here. Uh, but then, um, second round, obviously, we, he, he steadied the ship. And then third round, good night. And uh, <clears throat> I've got to tell this one. It was fantastic. Honestly, the, the atmosphere around it, when he knocked him down, when he won, you could see how, how much it went to him. And we were... Uh, we said to me and Diamond said, Let's go and see him in the dressing room. Obviously, because we'd had a few drinks. Let's go and see him in the dressing room. And as we're walking, he's well down there. He's celebrating. He's in there. And as we're walking down, Eddie Earn's dad's there, Barry Earn. And he went, where are you going, lads? I says, oh, we're going to see Tony. He went, what a result. Eh? He said, fantastic. I says, I know, Barry. I said, I thought he was struggling after the first round when he went down. I said, and then, and Barry went, yeah, he steadied the ship second round. And then all over third round. Graham Stewart looked at me, he tapped me, he went, did it go to third round? <laughs> he said, I thought he knocked him out in second. <laughs> so and then he I, says just a couple <laughs> of drinks as well, you know. <laughs> but I still haven't finished yet, so we're in there and we're hugging him and everything. And my kids had come down from Yorkshire with my nephew, there were four of them, all travelled down for the fight. And uh, I said I'd meet him in the Wimslow straight after. Anyway, I must have been half an hour in and around the dressing room and everything. And apparently one of my kids says to, to his brother, I wonder where my dad is. And they looked up at Sky Television in Wimslow and we were rugging him in the dressing room. They went, he's there, look. <laughs> is it possible to, to describe what went through your mind in that first round, Tony, when he, when he, when he knocked you off your feet? You seem to get up really, really quickly. Yeah. Uh... I can't believe this is happening. That was the first thing. No, not now. Uh, honestly, on the impact of the punch, my nose completely broke, and I just thought, it's not happening. I'm, I don't care what he's got, and I'm, I'm carrying on. Not, nothing was going to stop me on that night. That was the best way of saying it. Uh, I was the first time I was so comfortable, and and from studying him and watching him, I knew he was going to give me opportunities to hit him. And the thing that I will say is about all the opponents I've ever faced, sparring or fighting. When I hit them for the first time, they all change. They never continue to press me or do what they've done that I've studied them. And he is the only opponent in my whole life. I hit him clean in the first round. I touched him to the head, then the body. And he kind of sank a little bit when I touched him with the left hook, the body. And I stepped out and made the cardinal sin of doing that as I came out, lifting my chin up. And... And he just, I just caught the punch, the punch flush right on the nose. Uh, that snapped. I hit the deck, and then I just, I remember saying to myself, "Crack and shot that." And when I look back on the, <laughs> when I look back on the video, I'm actually saying "crack and shot" as the referee's counting. And I said, and he says to me, "You sure you're okay?" I said, "I'm sound, I'm sound." And the vet, the, the referee, in my opinion, he's he's done a few of my fights now. I think Victor Lachlan is the best country in, in Great Britain, and he, he's refed a few of my fights. He was there on the night. And he didn't over, over put too many questions to me, overemphasize on the knockdown too much. He just said, Tone, are you okay? I said, yeah. And he just said, walk towards me. Happy days, let it go on. So my uh, reflection of the first round was going absolutely great until my nose broke. <laughs> <laughs> what are your tactics then? Obviously, your nose is smashed all over the place. You've yeah. got to get through the round. You've then got to set yourself at the start of the second. Do you go into protective mode then? No, uh, I went back to the coach and then, uh, as usual with me, gives me a mouthful and uh, tells me off, you got greedy, son, you got greedy, that's how he said it, and he's screaming it, and I said, listen, I hate him with a body shot, I know he's feeling it, and he, he's going on to me, and I'm, I'm, 99% uh, of fighters go back to the corner, they listen to what the coach says and they don't say nothing back, I seem to be the one who's always got something to say. <laughs> 
And I, I just keep I need to keep my mouth shut and just get on with the fighting. But I said to him, I've got him, I've him. And he said, just steady the round, use your brain. And, and I, I did know I've got a really good boxing brain. I mean, I've got no other kind of brain, just a boxing brain. And it's good when I put it to use. And uh, second round, I steadied the ship, controlled with the jab, dictated the pace, and, uh, and tried my best not to get drawn in by the crowd. Because in that first round, to be honest, when I had him on the ropes, the, the cheer was so loud, and I just wanted to wipe him out there and them f <laughs> for them as much as me. When did you know you had him? When did you think to yourself, my dream's going to come true here, I've got him? He pressed me in the third round, and uh, I, I, funny enough, I broke his nose at the end of the second round with an uppercut, and then it comes out for the third round, and I, and I could see his nose. What I knew both of our noses were broke because the blood is a different colour when your nose breaks. It's a darker red. And it's I'll take your word for that. <laughs> it's a little enjoying your food. <laughs> and no apologies about that. Uh, it's just a, it's a deeper than a darker colour and a little bit thicker, which you don't need to know. But that's how I knew. Uh, and that that happened at the end of the second. So I told the coach once again, he's feeling it. He's definitely feeling it. And the one thing that we envisioned in this fight was he's a lad fr from Africa, and the one thing he didn't like was the cold. We put him in the smallest dressing room I could find. Listen, they do it to you. If you ever fight on someone else's patch, they'll stick him in a small dressing room and fill the room with about 100 people. Well, he actually wanted that. He wanted the smallest dressing room, and he wanted to fill it so they were like in a tin of sardines. It was nuts. And me coach, we send a member from each, each other's team to watch the hands get wrapped. And me coach went in and watched his hands get wrapped. And he said, when he was in there, me coach said he had a T-shirt on and he was dripping with sweat. He said, that that was Dave saying that to me. He said, Tone, I was in there and he was going, I'm cold, I'm cold. He said, everyone in the room was absolutely sweating cobs and they just wanted to get out. And he was still whinging, he was cold. And he said, brilliant. He said, he's going to start fast. And that, that would have suited me down to ground. I didn't think he would, but he did. And he gave me the opportunities. And then, like I say, harping on back to that first round, I could hit him and I could nail him and I've always said if I can hit someone early doors no fights going 12 rounds I don't care if you're heavyweight light heavyweight cruiserweight if I'm hitting you often and regular in the early parts of a fight it's only ending one way one of us is going it's as simple as that to be honest and and I found the shots I hit him with a counter left hook in the third as he pressed me and he it was it was like a Tom and Jerry at one stage. I hit him with the left hook, and he, he kind of ran back, and he never runs back. And as he ran back, I thought, I've got you. Don't stop. Just keep going. <laughs> Don't stop throwing. Don't give him a chance to recover. And uh, we got into that trade-off. Once on the ropes, back in, back out, and then I copped him with that left hook. And, and when you hit someone clean and as hard as that, with all your body weight behind, but the best way of saying is I was 15 stone. I gained 10 pounds from the way into the fight. So I was 15, st 15 stone sledgehammer, hit him clean on the chin, and I knew he was asleep the minute it hit him. <laughs> I just, I seen his head lean on the rope, and, and in boxing, it, it's, it's a ruthless and it's a horrible sport and business, but when his neck was leaned to the side and his eyes closed, I just said, you've got to have one more to finish the job, and then <laughs> bang, bang, kiss, kiss, bang, bang, and that was the end of it, so. I was just so, so happy. So you cracked him when the boys are asleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, it's it's boxing's a strange game, and and like I say, it, it just has, it's one of the things you'd have to make sure because I've been hit so hard before today. I remember Oval McKenzie hitting me, and I was asleep on my way to the floor, and when my head hit the floor face first, it woke me up. So I do understand that you know you've got to nail him until the referee actually physically gets older and, and just keep going and. I'm lucky I've got that kind of streak in me. Only when I've got boxing gloves on, but I, and I have to dig and search it, but I have got that kind of streak in me, and, and it paid off on the night. When the fight was stopped, the atmosphere out there, Snods, was unbelievable. We thought we were in Las Vegas, didn't we? Oh, it was incredible, but uh, just looking at Tony saying, I'm, I'm, uh, with her uh, left hook, I'm glad it weren't a right one, or I could have copped it just then. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, the atmosphere were fantastic, and not only because it's... Tony Bellew and Evertonian, but it, we're at Goodison Park as well. It'll never be replicated, that I don't believe. Do you, Tom? No, Not lots of people are asking me, will they do it again? And, and I've said no. The pressure that I felt was massive. And but trust me, I've been in high-pressure fights. But you have to remember, I'm the same as everyone in this room. I can't emphasise that he's enough. I'm just a normal lad, a scouser who's just good at having a fight, who supports Everton Football Club. And... In my mind, coming to the arena, and it was in my mind in the whole build-up to it, 
I've told everyone I'm going to win. I'm going to become world champion at Goodison. And if I didn't win that night, I would never have stepped foot in Goodison again. And I've spent my whole life coming here since I was a kid. And you've got to be, most Saturdays of my life have been spent here since the age of 10, 11. And if I would have lost, I wouldn't have come back. And that's not because of the fans, and that's not because of the club, because I think I'd endeared myself to them enough where they're always going to like me. Well, I think so, but I'm a blue through and through, but it's my own personal pride. I wouldn't have been able to come back here again, and I will never, ever put, me, put that at stake ever again. I've done it now. I've lived the dream. I can honestly say, hand on heart, I'm... I'm You'd meet very few people in life where you know what they can say to you. I achieved my lifelong dream. I I achieved my I, what I set out to do with my life. I mean, Miss I'm happy she's not here because she'd kill me right now. But <laughs> what I set out to do in my life, I achieved it and I done it. And, and that was the night at Goodison Park. And the only thing that comes even remotely close, and it's not me near it. it. My kids being born is obviously the greatest days of my life, but. But barring that, it's just that is the greatest night in my career, in my life. I can't put it into words how much it meant. What, well, what happens if we win the league this year? <laughs> I'll have a sparring session at the end of it, and then it'll, it'll be even better <laughs> on the pitch. I'll well, start I, with Swan as we get him over here for a special charity fight. <laughs> We're actually live here. Do you want to mention your wedding day as well while you're talking, Tony? Has been, your wedding day must be in your top million at least. I, do you know what? I've been with her 15 years and we're not married yet and she keeps going on at me and on at me and I just said, Gail, being together 15 years, I'm just getting to know you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm engaged never to be married. <laughs> yeah, just don't put that on that video over there because she literally will. She's, I'm not afraid of no man. I'm not a bud. I'll be honest, she frightens me at times. You might be able to propose if you can never get a word in edgeways, maybe. Um, so was, Tony was talking there before about putting the, the other boxer in the smallest dressing room and making it cold. And it's, uh, the first thing that went through my mind was Wimbledon and Plough Lane. Yeah, that's right. Um, when you play away from home, uh, they're exactly the same football teams. They put you in the, in, in the smallest dressing rooms or at Ivory uh, in particular. Um, they had underfloor eating at Ivory. And if you played them in August when the sun's shining, uh, they turned the eating up full blast, uh, the underfloor eating. So you were like... Pfft, sweating cobs before you even went out then if you played them in, in winter december january february uh they wouldn't even turn the the underfloor eating on so things like that go on but wimbledon were the worst in the world so uh, when they were played at plow lane uh, dave bassett uh were the, the manager they had fashion who uh, Vinnie Jones, they had Dave Besant, the keeper, uh, Alan Cork, etc. They were they were an hard team to beat and hard to compete with. But um, their dressing room, you could hear them shouting, you could hear the getter blaster on, full blast. And uh, it, it was an experience to play down there, but uh, you'd always call for a pot of tea at every away ground. Uh, but Wimbledon, you wouldn't, because you wouldn't know what they'd done to it before. <laughs> Seriously. They'd, they'd come in and said, do you want a pot of tea to the manager, to Howard or to Colin Harvey at the time? And uh, we'd like a pot. No, you're all right. We'll leave it this time. Of course, they're liable to do things to it. that, And it wouldn't taste very nice, to be honest. But, uh, yeah, it goes off in football. And I'm sh obviously, Tony's explained that it goes off in boxing, especially abroad. It does. It does. Uh, it goes on everywhere. I've boxed for my country and been all around the world. Uh, listen, I could tell you some stories. What's going on in England camps? It, it's not good, you know. I've seen fellas using shoes as toilets. <laughs> Billy Joe Saunders to his own teammates. Never mind the, never mind the, uh, the, the people who he was supposed to be facing. So I've seen a lot of that go on, and and I've played Sunday league football for for most of me life until about five years ago, till she banned me from playing because it stopped her income if I got injured. So. Uh, yeah, it does go on, it goes on at all levels and as you say, listening to think it go on at the highest tier of, of, of English football is just absolutely nuts but listen, it's, it's any way you can get an advantage. I think we're the only club who don't actually do it to others. <laughs> Seeing the dressing room they have here, it's lovely, everything's looked after, kids ironed and pressed and it, oh. we do, we look after people too much, we, we molly cuddle them. Didn't it galvanise you, those notes, particularly the Everton side of the mid-80s that you were in with your, with, with your, with your Reedies, your Kevin Ratcliffe, yourself and Sharpie and Big Neville? Didn't you say to yourselves in the dressing room, these are taking the mickey out of us, let's go out there and show them? I were quite fortunate. I come to join probably one of the best teams in Europe at the time, uh, in 87, and they'd been going from 84 when they started winning things, so, so I thought when I signed for them, wow, 
were a team. And it weren't until I actually went in that dressing room the first day of training. I trained with them that first day and I thought, what a team of, of lads these are. These are winners. And in one or two teams that I played in, you'll get one or two winners and one or two captains on the pitch. I believed Everton at the time had several captains, every one of them winners from Neville Southall's to Reedis uh, to Sharpies to your captain, Kev Ratcliffe. And it was so funny when, when I first arrived, I, I, I had a poor season and a half, I thought, as a midfield player. But just looking at them lads, um, you knew that they were going to win. Before we went out, I came from Leeds United and we were we were a second division team then because it was the old first division. Uh, it weren't the Premier League then. And uh, when you played for Leeds at the time, we didn't know if we were going to get beat one week to the next or win one. We Everton. Yeah. The first game I came in, I'd been used to Billy Bremner coming in and giving you a team talk from two o'clock onwards, right till when you went out at ten to three. His assistant giving you all the free kicks where you had to be and Billy Bremner geeing everybody up individually for about 50 minutes. When I arrived at Everton for that first game, I never even seen Howard Kendall. And I'm going to the lads, where's the gaffer? I do it, oh, I'd be having a little drink in his office. And I'm thinking, have a little... next thing, the bell goes at 10 to 3 and he appears. And I'm thinking, we're going out now. And he's like, Colin Harvey had done all the free kicks, corners, etc. But all Howard did were, he clapped his hands and went, same again this week, boys. Go out and do it. <laughs> and that was it. But he knew it was true. And that's all the lads needed because they were that good. They could not they could beat anybody. And as, and as the lads go in walking out of the dressing room door, just stand there, give you a little tap on backside, give you a wink, and you knew that were it. You'd, you'd go in and do the business. And... Uh, I just weren't used to that, especially the pat on the backside and the wink. <laughs> but uh, no, but what a team. It, you just knew uh, it weren't a case of you're going to win, it was going to case of how many. And I tell you what, it'd be great to get back to that. But one thing about it, Daz, I were confident we went up to Sunderland. I knew we were going to win. And I thought to myself then, how many? And that's the first time for a long time I thought, we're, we're going away, that we're going to win. But how many is it going to be? The difference between Sunderland this week and Sunderland in May last season when we didn't even sell out, and that's, no. that's just unheard of because you know as well as anybody, the away support, Tony, is just second to none. It's phenomenal. It's unbelievable. And I get the away games. West Brom away this year was just, it was madness. Absolute madness. And they don't start from the minute they start, they don't stop. And it was just brilliant. It's just, it, well, you know what? It's... It, it's it's over documented about many times people say the people's club and this and that but everyone knows everyone uh, when you get through them turnstiles and everyone's just screaming it's nuts but it's great at the same time and, and you know what it's Everton that's the best way of saying it. it's just Everton and I know does that uh, my three lads go to away games quite regular I just give them the tickets and I know once they get in that ground there's so many people I know and like they all know each other that they're going to be well looked after for like the two hours that they're in the ground. So I know they're going to be safe because we are Etonians. Yeah. And it must be great for you because you can sit where you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who's going to move you, by the way? Uh, you know what? It's just, I just love going to match still. I wish, I don't know. I, I go to match and, and people think I'm something I'm not. I'm, I just love watching Everton and I just love going to games. So I'm flattered and amazed and everyone says, like, can we have photos of your lad? And, but I just I want people to know I'm just a fella who's just the same. I just love watching Evan and I just like going to match and having a scream and having a laugh. Uh, when I set, I've had I've caught people a couple of times on video me when we score and I I'm saying lad I'm just celebrating like you. I'm not. I think they expect me to go well done boys when they score. <laughs> I'm scared, I'm effing and blind screaming, get in, and when referees don't say something, I'm going, I'll strangle the life out of you to the referee and stuff, but. I can't emphasise I'm, I'm just a normal fan and, and I'm trying to help my kids grow up the same way as I did. I mean, I don't know if that's good or bad, like, but uh, we, I go to as many games as I possibly can and when I miss the game, I'm sick. So it's just Everton in it. Like, that's the best way. I, it's the only words I have, it's Everton. But no, when you said, Tony, you come out of that tunnel and the cars were playing and the lights were, and the roar, that's what it like is like for a footballer playing for Everton every week. Uh, I I'd, I'd, I'd have loved it, not to have felt magnificent what when you're coming down that playing, tunnel yeah. and Zed Cars is playing. You can hear all the fans. But not only that, when you travel away, I've expressed this loads of times, when you travel away, 
it's like Wigan came a couple of years ago uh, and they brought 323 fans 25 uh, minutes away. Now, that doesn't give you a lift as a, as a player when you go out of that tunnel at away end and you see his sparse supporters. When you go out week in and week out and see the Everton fans packed to the rafters, it gives you a massive lift. And uh, even Jerry Delafer, who's come out with it again today, the fans the other day up at Sunderland. And I, I go back to the Barnsley game uh, pre-season. Uh, not pre-season, cup game, was it, weren't it, Daz? Cup game. And we was on Sky. It was a Tuesday night. And we took 5,500 to Barnsley. Incredible. And you know, as a player, when you run out and you see that, believe me, it does get to you and it does inspire you. So long may it continue, long may we sell out and long may we be Everton Football Club. It tells you everything you need to know about Everton, five and a half thousand mm. on a night like And it was live on the television. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, I always tell the story about when we played Blackburn Rovers in a pre-season friendly. I think it was Roberto's third or fourth game as manager and himself and Graeme Jones came out before the start of the game, saw all the crowd behind the goal. And I think they went back in to re rename the team because they treated it as a bit of a kickabout. And Roberto said to me, Wigan played Blackburn Rovers at Ewood Park. And it was a six-pointer with three games to go in the Premier League. And whoever won more or less stayed in the Premier League. Wigan didn't even take half the fans that we took to a meaningless pre-season friendly. Unbelievable. I know, and I know, the, I know the volume of away support catches a lot of people by surprise when they first come to this football club. It's the levels and the sizes and the magnitudes and what's expected at football clubs. And someone like Roberto will have got the the shock and the fight well because we don't we're not a club that gets the huge exposure or or always going on about our history and all the other things that. And there's no about. stand. Yeah. <laughs> Does my head in that? Does my head in that? You know, they only made it that big really so we can see it. Really, it's stand though, They only, made, they only made it that big so we can see it. That's the only reason they made it like that. It didn't need to be that big. Have you seen? They go on at our, our views and our ground, and I've, I've seen some of the views printed on it. Don't start me off. On Don't that. forget, <laughs> we're live. We're be, live. We'll be made here. I'm telling you now. If you start me off. On <laughs> no, it's. We haven't got any adverts we can show, have we, man? <laughs> it just. You know what? It's, it, we don't get the recognition we we deserve. To be honest, our fans are up there with any fans in the Premier League in world football. I don't care what they say. We go everywhere. The team are thoroughly backed. Even when we're against the odds, you go to places like away to Chelsea, away to Arsenal, places where teams like us aren't expected to win, and they're still we still sell out. So um, and you know other teams go to these places and they don't sell out. Who are supposedly bigger teams? They'll spend more money or whatever it is. But these teams don't have the following Everton Football Club. People have got to remember, we are a huge football club. We are Everton Football Club, and Everton Football Club is a huge, successful team. And I'm just hoping we can get back to what we were doing and the way we were going about things in the 80s. Because like I've gone on record as saying a few times now, this is the best squad since the 80s, and we have to capitalise on what we've got now. Without a shadow, we've got young players, internationals all over the park. We've got quality internationals on the bench. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't too long ago when, with all due respect, you know, we we had some players who were just, you know, I don't want to name names, but I'm yeah. just going to send name names to. <laughs> You're not going back to the nineties now, are you? <laughs> but you know, it, it, there were some players over the years that I've seen, and I just think to myself, and now I look at our bench and I think they would have been are outstanding players in them years when I had my season ticket in that Gladys and, and we've just should be so happy with where the club's going, the way we've moved forward and progressed. The average age of the squad, it, it, things like that, it, you can't buy that and like I say the quality. You've got a lad there up front, Romelu, uh, 22 or 23 I think he is now, I think he's 23 and the kid just scores goals for fun. You, you, you've got to understand he is irreplaceable and the club have refused, well the club haven't sold him and that just shows where Everton Football Club is going and the things that we are trying to achieve at this club because you've seen them over the road when they had the first offer for one of their most outstanding talents and still and he was gone. Gone. They're a the selling club. They've been calling us for years. The... <laughs> so uh, every top player, the every top player who scores goals, they sell. Torres scores goals, gone. Suarez scores goals, gone. Sterling does well, gone. I'm not getting involved. You can say it, I'm not. <laughs> no, but it's You're going to get no comeback, are we? <laughs> 
but it's it's true. I get I get stick off off on, pints Tom. all the time, and and they're always saying, lad, you're a small club and this and that. Well, do you know what? Do you know what the biggest signing for me was this summer? Keeping Romelu Lukaku. That was the biggest signing of them all. Because you, no matter what happens, you could sell him for 50, 60, 75, 80 million. You can't replace what he can do. Because if someone's going to come here who can score a 20-plus goal season, with all due respect, they're not going to join us straight away right now. They might join us in three or four years' time, but anybody who can score a guaranteed 20 Premier League goals in a season isn't joining Everton now, and we've kept hold of, of Romelu Lukaku. And that, for me, is, is an amazing sign of things to come. Well said, Tony Bellew. <laughs> Sorry, I always have, man. I've got to stop. <laughs> Just tell me to shut up, that. Honest to God. You must be joking. <laughs> There's every chance that Romelu will score 20 goals this season on the uh, performance at Sunderland. Not just his finishing, but the supply lines were just terrific. Snods. We were pairing over them, weren't we? Yeah, I, I didn't do commentary first half. Uh, Graham Stewart did it, and as soon as we got rid of him on commentary, Look things you. started to happen, obviously. <laughs> so, a uh, great substitution, does on the commentary to start with. But uh, it was a great ball in first half, Belassi. Uh, Romelu did everything right, I felt. But the kid uh, pulled a great save off first half. Didn't play particularly well. And I thought probably three of our better players, not better players, uh, uh, players that can score goals, Kevin Morales, Ross Barkley and Rom, weren't really at the race. And I think they, they might admit that as well, uh, if they were honest. But second half, uh, he made a little substitution. The manager, who doesn't seem too afraid to say what he wants to say and make changes when he wants to, and that's refreshing. It's brilliant. That's a that's how I'd want it as a player. Uh, tell me if I'm doing well. Tell me if I'm doing bad. And that's what he seems as though he, he, he the way he goes about it. And then second half, um, Adrissa Gay to me, I think could be the bargain of the year. Uh, I said to Daz after the f first friendly game when he gave a penalty away, he gave a couple, he got caught in possession a couple of times. Then you could see what he were about the remainder of the Espanol, weren't they, the game? And uh, I'm thinking he's all right him, but then the more I see him, I think he's more than a little ball winner. He can play, and that first ball for Romelu's goal were a great, great delivery. And I just said in commentary, hey, your name's got that written all over it, Rom, 1-0. Balassi, we've seen in patches before Sunderland what he can do. But I thought at Sunderland, we saw that he's going to be an exciting player for us. He got pace, he's got ability, he loves a roll over, <laughs> over the ball with his foot kind of thing. But he got to the byline again, put that away. And then what a through ball from Kevin for the third one. But as soon as Rom went through... I'm thinking, at trick, at trick straight away, because he's got two, his confidence will be high, and that's the kind of balls that Romelu thrives on, stuff like that. So he got two with Belgium uh, in midweek before the game, and he's now got three for us. He's got three great games to add to that total, I believe. Uh, we're coming up, we've got Middlesbrough here, and the, com the confidence that we were around the dressing room area, not actually, because I, I wouldn't dream of going anywhere near that dressing room or in invading space when the manager or the players there, but we were in the tunnel, me and Graham Stewart and Daz, and uh, the boys were coming out and they were brimming with confidence. And it's great, smile on the face, and you could tell that they can't wait for the next game. So hopefully on Saturday, they'll be all up for it again. The manager uh, is excited as well and uh, hopefully we can do, go and do it again on Saturday, does get another three points, and then we've got two games that are winnable again on paper, so it could be a great start for us. I'll just verify what Snod, Snod said about the dressing room. The only time we go near the dressing room is when the players have gone, the team coach has left the car park, then we can't get in the dressing room quick enough because the mountain of food that is still in there. It is, it's ridiculous. It's unbelievable, isn't it? The wastage, in all seriousness, is ridiculous. I had a couple of oranges and a, and a um, piece of watermelon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll see what Daz were eating. Yeah. It's scandalous. <laughs> it is shocking, but we do our best to clear it, don't we? How much do you eat after the weigh-in? And before the fight, you don't want to know. It's just ridiculous amounts. I just you can literally eat as much as you want, can't you? Tim? Well, no, uh, you. I've just be, been for a Nando, uh, by the way. I'll be totally honest now. When I was making light heavy, that's twelve stone seven. Right now, I'm fifteen stone four, so I'd have to lose like three stones to get down to the old weight. I used to eat anything 
I could get my hands on when I used to do 12 7 and, I, and I'd gain like a stone plus overnight, maybe somewhere anywhere up to 20 pounds I've gained in a night when I was doing the old weight. At this weight, it's very regimented, it's, it's put out exactly the amount I eat, but it's all carbohydrates with the breast of chicken, so it's a uh, it's not that much to be honest. I don't like to get in the ring on a full belly, I like to get in on a bit of an empty stomach and, and supplements that get me through it, so they're called like pro slams and stuff like that. And, it's just, it's just fight, you know what I mean? Just, <laughs> just no one there. They want, on the day of the fight, once you weigh in, you, you are wary of exactly what's going on with your body. It was only the last four or five, well, three, four years, I'd say, I've paid attention to from weighing because I, I've been known to just go from weighing to Nando's, beating cheesecakes, everything. And then when I had the nutritionist on board, he was like, listen, do you understand what you're doing to your body? You're dieting for months at a time. And then the night before the biggest fight of your life, you're sticking a load of diesel in a Porsche. And I just went to him, you've got a bit of a point there, haven't you? I wonder, <laughs> wonder why I've been feeling a bit heavy like the, I'm big bellied on the way to the, onto the way to the uh, stadiums. But it, it's a learning experience. 90% uh, of top level fighters now, especially world champions, they have a nutritionist, dietitian. I, I do have all I'm on board now, but uh, I've still got a little sweet tooth here and there, you know, the bonbons and the galaxy bar of chocolate and <laughs> the odd fizzy drink. But like, I, I stay clean while I'm in camp. Right now, the, the worst it gets is a Nando's, which I've had with me little boy before. <laughs> Couldn't stand that's not, could you? No, oh, dear me, he was. <laughs> I'm that embarrassed about my body. I'd be the only boxer that would keep me robe on to fight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a body beautiful. I'm not one of them. You look at me. I'm, I'm the skinny fat kid. So uh, I'm always known as the fat boy of boxing. I've never been one to focus on my body. Even at light heavyweight. Don't get me wrong. At light heavyweight, I had the six pack. That wasn't through. I wanted it. That was purely because I just couldn't lose any more fat. There was none left to lose. But at this weight, I'm kind of a. I don't know. Long and round. But it, but it works. So it's better than being short and round, isn't it? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> it have you works. ever failed? A, have you ever failed a weigh-in? Uh, I haven't. No, uh, and such would it doesn't uh, it doesn't happen because they are costly procedures. I have seen guys lose a lot of money on scales when they fail weight. I mean, it's not going to be in all honesty. It's not going to happen with me at this weight. It's it came close at light heavyweight when I faced Adonis Stevenson in Canada. I think I have him as the only person who genuinely beat me. Uh, I got on the scales and weighed on smack bang 175 pounds, not an ounce under, not an ounce over, and I had nothing left I could get off. The only other thing that was left to come off was the underpants, and I wasn't getting the goldfish off for no one, to be honest. <laughs> so, uh, I just, I got on them scales that day and I'd lost four to five pound on the morning of the weigh-in in a hot bath, hot bath and salt, and I've never felt so drained or I had nothing left. The best way, it was the closest I've ever come to a breakdown, besides Wimbledon and Everton that day. <laughs> if a boxer is a couple of pound over the, the weigh-in weight, yeah. What, what does he do? What does he Once have to he's do? weighed in, you mean yeah. he's over? He's, I've he's, seen he, it a couple he needs, of times. He needs to then go and lose a couple of pounds yeah. in what, an hour or two? I've seen it a couple of times. Well, the first place usually they led to is the sauna, which which they should never do because there's a there's a fluid called the cervical fluid around your brain and that stops your brain from hitting your skull. And when you lose weight drastically, well, water drastically, you can't lose fat in the space of a couple of hours. So what happens is you have to lose water. And I think your body is 70% water. So... When you drain the water, this little tiny bit of cervical fluid reduces from your brain, and that is the most dangerous thing you can do, and that's how fighters get brain damage. They, they lose too much water too soon. So that's how they do. They go to the sauna, they'll skip, or they'll do whatever they're going to do. I have never, ever, and I can hand on heart say, to make weight. I've tried it. The first fight with the other fellow from Wales, I tried to lose that loads of weight. Uh, I, tried, I think I lost 16 pounds in 16 hours and I had five pounds left to go and I just couldn't get it off anymore. I went in the sauna for two and a half hours. My trainer lost nine pounds next to me <laughs> and I lost half a pound in, in, in an hour or two hours in the sauna, whatever it was. And, and I just remember thinking, I can't do this. It's just ridiculous. So I have seen fighters. Saunas are usually the ones for the guys who lose weight. Just, all fights have got different ways of doing weight. Personally, me, two pounds a week every week so you know it's as simple as that but uh was that genuine hate yeah i can't stand the meat so right, i don't okay. even want to talk about it <laughs> only asking i absolutely despise it. 
I mean, so if uh, it's not good if me and him come face to face anywhere anytime, it's just not going to be a good outcome. Not for me, or well, for me it's going to be good, but it's not going to be for him. <laughs> uh, we just don't like each other. It, we, you know what? We, I know, like, we were supposed to talk after the fight, after the rematch, because just to put it to bed and get it over and done with. And uh, he said, "I'm gonna can I come in the dressing room and uh, me and my girlfriend come in." And I said, "Listen, I'm sending everyone out of my dressing room." And it's just going to be me and you talking. And he went, no. So that was it. Because, you know, I'd come in and sit down. You and your wife come down and sit down. We're going to have a talk. You know, we're not a happy family, mate. I don't like you. You don't like me. But we're talking cheek hands. But he wouldn't do it. And well, I, what's he up to now? Because you don't... He's he fighting for a world title next week. Yeah, he's he? gone back down to light heavyweight. And uh, he's fighting for a world title next week. So, you know what? I, <laughs> I, I, I actually don't. I hope he does. Or I just hope he stays safe. You know, at the end of the day, I've beat him... Uh, from what I said from the first fight, why why I died with three rounds to go. I still think I won to this day, but I didn't get it. Uh, I wouldn't say I won to get beat, but I, I, I just... Yeah, I made up. You do, great. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's just say you're non-plussed, as long as it's a decent fight and they both come out okay. I hope they both come out okay. And you know what? I hope he wins. Forget it. You know, let him get on with his career. I'll get on with mine. And uh, still can't stand you like, but it is what it is. <laughs> who were the lads in the 80s and the 90s, Nods, who used to come back yeah, after was, the I've summer? I've never asked you that, Nods. Who was your favourite fighter in the 80s? Because you had some great fighters yeah, there. Yeah, we did. Richard Dunn. Anybody remember him? Yeah. The Yorkshireman. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Do you know what? Richard I used, to, I used to love watching <laughs> Paul Hodgkinson from Rock Liverpool. Oh, yeah. yeah, when I first arrived over okay, here, I thought, "What a great, exciting WBC little fighter. champion!" He was the last WBC champion before me. So. Yeah, fantastic. I love me boxing. And I, I thought the Eubank Ben fights were yeah. were fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, what happened to Watson when he fought Eubank as well? But I thought around that era, uh, I used to love it. All boxing, uh, we Agler. Um, oh, etc. Sugar Ray Leonard. So uh, you were lucky to be around. Yeah, I was. I was, uh, and I really enjoyed watching boxing. Still do to this day. Mm. Uh, nothing more than I enjoy watching you, mate. Um, but you. I do. I, I love watching me boxing, and uh, I think it's a massive, a massive thing in Liverpool. Uh, mm. And you didn't really get it in Yorkshire much. Uh, these kids fighting. We we had one in our school, and we all thought boxing. And then you come down here and you see all kids in these boxing clubs and see how big boxing is in Liverpool and it's even grown on me even more since I moved down here that uh, I do love my boxing part. I had no chance of being a footballer. My granddad always told me, listen lad, being a scouser it's one or two things. You're either really good at telling jokes or you're really good at having a fight, but you better get good at one of them. <laughs> to be, to be so, honest, <laughs> that's what he told me. To be and honest, I just told. said I think I'll have to fight Granddad because I'm not the best comedian. No, you, you played out here once in a charity game. Ah, uh, yeah, me. Stick I, to boxing, mate. <laughs> Yeah, I thought so. Told you. He's <laughs> learned the scouse way. Jokes, is it? Striker. <laughs> Striker he was. He was all right, to I be honest. All right. Put yourself about. Yeah, I put myself about and I get stuck yeah. in. I like to think I've got two feet, but made an absolute show of myself on soccer. I'm on Saturday, <laughs> didn't I? And you know what? I'm going to blame the trampoline because the way he was throwing them balls, the trampoline, he, was, he just wanted me to fall over. I knew he did. <laughs> And then, but the main thing is, I was part of the winning team, so it doesn't matter. I, I, I'm a team player, not. Um, we've had some questions sent in via Twitter. I'll just go through. So we'll answer. We'll answer these quite quickly. Then we'll throw the floor open for ten minutes or so. So have a think about what questions you want to ask the lads. Uh, I'll ask you both the first one. Uh, at K Whitaker ninety seven Snods, where are we realistically going to finish in the league? Well, it's hard to say, uh, especially after the season Leicester had. Confidence breeds confidence. Uh, we've got to a fantastic start. We've got three winnable games, next three games. Who knows? Um, I'm, I'm enjoying what I'm watching. I really am. I'm thinking I've got a manager there that is not settling for second best. Uh, if the lads are not working hard enough, you can see him on the touchline, driving them forward, wants even more out of them. Uh, we had a little chat with him when he first came over, uh, when he when he signed for the club, me, Sharpie and Graham Stewart, and we liked what we heard, we liked what he, he wanted to do, and uh, he's a winner. And uh, I don't know where we'll finish, Daz, because I'm enjoying what I'm watching now, and who knows? Things could be very, very good at the end of could the season. Could be exciting, Tony, couldn't it? The one thing I will say is, is I believe we've always had great flair, well, for the last five, six, seven years, we've always had good players going forward. 
But since Moyes left, the defence had just... It, just take the first season and he come out, out of the equation. The last two seasons, the defence defender just hasn't been good enough. And we've had quality defence. You have to remember that the, the defensive players that were there, Jags, Baz, Sheamus, uh, Stonesy or Silve, whichever one, it, it was the same four in place. And we had an outstanding defence under Moyes. And then, you know, the, we started playing too much football. But now that defence looks solid again and that for me is the most important thing because if you're not conceding goals you will always be in with a chance of winning games if you're conceding for fun you're going to you know if, you're, if your goals are going in it doesn't matter how many you score if Newcastle all them years ago the prime example aren't they? if you're conceding for fun you, you're not going to win things and the majority of the time you're going to lose games and it'll be heartbreaking but the defence this season has been absolutely fantastic and I know we're only X amount of games in but there's just a different kind of solidness about them, the way they perform. And, you know, there's times when they're just putting the foot through the ball. And I'm so happy to see that because I'm not one of these fellas who thinks, you know, every player should be able to play football. Stones, he, as, as much as me mate he is, and he's a great, fantastic defender. He's a luxury defender. He's a luxury defender for some clubs. And, and, and at us, like at this moment in time, we can't afford to have that and be playing football out all the time. Sometimes you just got to go, you know what, Rosette. Again, uh, again, Sunderland, it emphasised exactly what Tony's on about because Jaggy Elka got a couple of great yeah. blocks in from shots at the edge of the mm. box. And then three minutes before the end, we were 3 0 up. The game's absolutely. We won it. I know it. exactly what part you're talking and about. And Ashley Williams defended and he shouted at his midfield yeah. players, Come on, get hold of them. I tell you what. Like that, got generals like in the that. team, lads who, mm. who are proper fellas, proper mushes. Yep. Yeah, get stuck in, have a good go, and meet Ashley and seeing that the respect and the camaraderie back amongst them is, is a big thing as well. Like I say, we're always going to score goals, our club, and our, the, the team we've got in place with Kevin going forward. You have Jerry now, Yannick, who, who can do something. The funny enough, Yannick, I was in Finch Farm for Yannick's first day when he turned up. And I don't, well, I was there for some kind of function or something to see the lads, and I bumped into Yannick by accident. And we hadn't, it hadn't come through that we'd signed yet, like an hour or two later, it come on Sky Sports News. And so Seamus comes up into, to, into the canteen, and the first thing Seamus said is, Thank bleep, I don't have to play against you again, lad. I am so, <laughs> a, I am so happy to see you here. And, and Baz Baines, he says the same thing. Baines and Seamus say he is the... I'm not saying he's the best player because that's ridiculous. You've got players like your Hazards and your Sanchez. But they say he's the hardest player to play against. He does something and does things with a ball. No other player, you can't expect it. Whereas a player would usually knock it with the lead foot and then run. You're on level pegging with them. Sometimes you've got a yard on them. He drags it with the back foot, so he's got a yard on you. And he's that quick. If he's got one yard on you, you're just not catching it. I don't care what defender it is. He is going to give you fits because he's so unpredictable. He's so direct and he's so fast. He's just... It's great to see what we are going forward now. Like I said, the biggest point for me is is how we defend now, and and that is that is a big big thing going forward. That's James Barry Junior. Sorry, won. you know what? I didn't answer the question. Did I? What a stupid man! Yeah. Yeah. We've only got another hour. Yeah, we've, we've been all week. I reckon we're going to finish. So I, I shouldn't say that, but listen, we keep performing the way we do. Expect the top four or five finish, but it. it I like to judge a Christmas. I don't like to say it now, even though I just have like a dope. I, I just think after Christmas, you'll see where we're at. If we're anywhere amongst the top four by Christmas, then I just expect a great running. James Barry, Junior One, has said uh, one for you, Tony. Hello, champ. Have you ever put Big Dunk through a little session in the ring? And if yes, is he any good? Duncan's a good boss, Valley. He's my friend. Uh, it's mad that I say something like that. <laughs> Duncan Ferguson's my mate. <laughs> Uh, I haven't trained with him. Duncan Duncan trains quite hard in the gym when he gets in there, but uh, he's a boss fella and and tough, old school, hard as nails fella who's a really really good person, and most importantly he's a proper Evertonian. You can't you, you don't make the likes of us anymore. He's a proper blue. So, what was it like as a teammate? Yeah, I didn't have that long with him, um, to be quite honest, uh, unfortunately, because I thought what a terrific player he were. He came down with Ian Durant, who I was a, a big mate of, because I had a bad injury that kept me out for a couple of seasons, and Ian Durant had a bad knee that kept him out for a couple of seasons, so we went to Lillishall in Staffordshire, and we met up quite... Shropshire. Quite, quite, all right, sorry. 
<laughs> no, me mate was there at the show. Was he? Sorry. All right. My geography is not as good as yours. <laughs> I'm sure it's Staffordshire. <laughs> Check it out. It's Shropshire. Anyway, anyway you now wherever it is, shut up, somebody talk. Google shut up, a little talk. show. Sit down. Oh, oh this is going to come to blows. <laughs> No, it didn't. Believe it's the one you know says. It is. If he said it's Shropshire, it's Shropshire. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> if he says it's in Aberdeen, it's in bloody Aberdeen, by the way. So, uh, yeah, so me and Durant, he got on really well, and uh, there were talks of us getting Ian Durant, and as part of the loan deal as well, Big Duncan were coming. And uh, I said to Duranty, what's he like? And he went, off his head. <laughs> and I went, what? He went, off his head, mate. So, but when he came down, got on really well with him because I kind of made Ian Durant feel at home and took him out for a f few social drinks, show him where places were. <laughs> and uh, Big Dunk ended up on the, uh, on the train with us as well. So, uh, no, great lad. As, he, as Tone said, massive, massive Everton. He's still idolised by... All you fans and all the fans out there. So I'm just glad he's uh, he's still at the club. Uh, I know Ronald thinks hell of a lot of him, and Erwin Kuman does, and Jan, uh, the fitness coach, thinks a lot about Duncan. So he's he's still part of a team that hopefully is going to be successful. One more question from the list that we got from Twitter. Then, as I say, we'll throw the floor open. So have a little think over the next couple of minutes. Tony, play for Everton or box and win a title and a belt. I suppose. Would you rather? I've had that night that you had. I, I, I get that question a million times and I'll give you the same answer I give every time. Do you think I enjoy getting punched in the face? <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I would take being a consistent number nine for this football club over 20 world title belts in a row. Mate, it doesn't. I don't enjoy getting punched in the face and I don't enjoy turning up at a venue thinking, am I going to make it home tonight? <laughs> uh, it's not a good feeling, no. Oh, I just, I wish I could have played football for Devon. Like I say, that, that would have been the lifelong um, dream and ambition, but the fact is I was just too fat uh, and I wasn't good enough, so, you know, I chose to punch people in the Parfum, face instead. Was, it was touch and go, wasn't it, apart from that? <laughs> yeah, well, it was. <laughs> Do you know what? I, I, like I say, I've, I've come as close as I can possibly play to play, and I've played in charity games. That was over. That was over the moon to do that, and I will do once the game's over. But like I say, mate, I've lived the dream, and I've got as close to my profession as it can allow to, to play football at Goodison Park. Is the right answer. Um, right, just throw your hand in the air. We've got a few minutes left for questions from the floor, and this is where traditionally everybody stares back at me. No, brilliant. One, two, and three. Yep. Good question. Just for the benefit of the, of the viewers around the world, how do you see the Liam Smith fight going the weekend? I thought... So I'll tell you what I know, and then I'll give you my prediction. So Liam got a cut, a uh, six stitches in a cut about six weeks ago and and it, 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 although it's healed and the, and the wound is closed now uh, I just think when it, that gets hit in the first few rounds that's going to open and I think that's going to spoil the fight for them if Liam didn't have a cut Liam will push Canelo all the way because one thing about Liam is he's different from his brothers his brothers are predominantly good very very good boxers uh, can fight too but good boxers Liam is predominantly a fighter Liam likes to fight and can get really stuck in so Liam as a fighter, would have been a great match for Canelo, but I just I don't like the fact that he's got this cut and it's gonna blood's gonna go into his eye. If it doesn't open up and it holds up strong, it'll be a great fight. It will really, really be a good fight. So I'm pray I'm shouting and praying. I hope Liam wins. I really do because if Liam beats Canelo in Texas, Texas is as good as Mexico. I've been to Texas. There's more Mexicans in Texas than there is Americans. So. Uh, believe you me, Texas is a mad place. I went there with Jamie McDonald when he won. Uh, it, it, the crowd's going to be against them. It'll be the greatest victory of a, of an Englishman abroad ever, in my opinion. I think it'd be even better than when Lloyd Donegan beat Don Curry. For those who haven't got a clue, who he is just someone who's done a really good win on abroad. <laughs> um, so who else? Yeah, did you have your hand up, my mate? Who was the second one? Yeah. Yeah. When you're not Flores out, who's next up? So just got to knock him out first, mate. <laughs> uh, do you know what? There's talk of a few. I've got to commentate on uh, Glavatsky versus Yusuf on Saturday. I want unification fights or I want to fight the bitch from Bermondsey, to be totally honest. That's the fight I want. Uh, there's talk of it going to Wembley early next year. He wants to fight Lucas Brown, WBA heavyweight champion. They're over, rigmarole over that. I'd be made up to fight for the heavyweight title, mate. You know, I'm happy to gain the pounds. I'll have a bit of that Chinese... Uh, <laughs> couple of changs and their jobs are good mate you know what I mean I just get stuck in so 
to answer your question, I'd love it to, to be a, a unification fight or, or, or the, the, the tar from Bermondsey. <laughs> the Chinese and the Chang will work, by the way. It's worked for me and Snod's over anyway. <laughs> well, I, I was clocking you, Daz, and I thought that, to be honest. So I just didn't want to be rude and say it. Yep. Who's your biggest influence in your boxing career? Biggest influence in your boxing career? Biggest influence in my boxing career? Uh, that's a good question. I'd be honest, I grew up watching Mike Tyson. Uh, it's a, there's a couple of them. I grew up watching Mike Tyson as a kid, getting up early hours in the morning like everyone did. Uh, I idolised Riddick Bow basically because he was similar to me, a big fat fella, loves a fight and, and cannot hide away his temptation to go to the fridge late at night. <laughs> uh, speaking to him, getting to know him, I turned him into an Evertonian. Uh, was was a big part of it. There's loads of them, mate. Really, Nigel Ben is my favourite ever British fighter. Riddick Bowe's my favourite ever all-time fighter. And then I've had so many influences sitting down and meeting Mike Tyson, having dinner with him. Uh, Roy Jones. I'm very lucky. And then on top of all that, I was in a movie with Sylvester. <laughs> it's, it's like, so I, I, you know what? It's mad. I've met them all. Really, it's crazy. I've just a kid from Liverpool. I've met all these people and I've been round them and they. It's nuts, and then I'm meets with Everton players. It's crazy, me like I said, you could never have envisioned that just a, a scally kid from Liverpool, south of Liverpool, to have seen the mad things I've seen and being part of it. It's crazy. So, when you were at school in Waverley, tell did you ever tell the careers master that you were going to be a world champion movie star? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I always remember the, the math teacher. He used to annoy me something else, and I, you know. I'm, I'm, I was alright at maths as well, I wasn't good at anything else, but I was alright at maths because I always just thought if I can count money, I'll be alright. <laughs> so I paid attention as best as I could in maths. And uh, I'm sure everyone in here has got a story about the teacher saying something to them, but he genuinely hated me, I could tell by the way he looked at me. And uh, my good thing that I had going for me was he knew me dad was, and he knew me dad could have a fight. And one day he got a grip me arm and I said, when my arm fella gets older, you... I'm telling you now, he'll strangle the life out of you. And he looked at me and he went, go and tell him. And I said, never mind him. When I get to an age, I'll come back here and I'll flatten you. And he went, I'm sure you will. Get out. And I got suspended for that comment. But I, I bet he looks back now and thinks, I tell you what, I wouldn't like him turning up at this school to give me that crack he promised me. You've never been asked to hand out the prizes then at the prize giving, no? I've been asked at every other school, but never mind. So I'm assuming, I'm assuming he's still there, to be honest. What was it like for you, Snods? Was it football or bust for you? Did you always want to be a footballer? Yeah, it was really. Uh, my brother Glyn, who three years older than me, had a, he was always one step above me and uh, he was always a footballer from 16 year old. So I, me being 13, Glyn being 16, I were always looking to do what he was doing and, he, and try even better to do and better him. And uh, to this day, I always tell him I bettered him uh, throughout his football career. Uh, but no, he's still involved. He's still at Preston with Simon Grayson as assistant manager. Uh, he had a decent career, Leeds, uh, Sheffield Wednesday, etc. So for me, he does, yeah. Uh, I just looked up to my brother, wanted to be better than him. And... Uh, I just wanted to be a footballer. Uh, Do you always say the youngest sibling is the one? So I'm praying my youngest is Everton, plays for Everton. Mm. Because my eldest one who's here now, uh, I've lost the hope with that one, to be honest. He's <laughs> asking to go in a boxing ring or everything, but the, I'm, I've got all my money. I've got all the money banked on the baby, the three-year-old, so he better play. I, I talk, better play. We just talked We just talked to him in the in the corridor, and with his looks, he can be a film star. Yeah, he's a good looking kid. He's certainly like got his, his mother's looks. Yeah, yeah, he's got his mother's looks. Looks like his mother, definitely. He's got no <laughs> looking like me, to be honest. I thought my worst fear is boxing for them, so that that's just not happening. Too pretty and oh, too just nice bring them, If you bring them along to Finch Farm, they will play. Don't worry about well, that. I, I was thinking <laughs> that, but then... I just thought I'm praying me for the youngest one. If I could have a kid play for Everton, Everton, that would just be be as good as me playing that. <laughs> I'd be playing for him and with him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, he's turning up. Yeah, You'd have to behave be yourself in the director's box then, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm still trying. Just, I've got like something to just hold my lips when I'm sitting around important people. Just don't say nothing when the game's going on. I see Tony being escorted to the director's box, obviously, as a, as a guest of the chairman, and I always think, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? We sat together at, at one of the games, sorry, it's not, and... He's, as we're sitting there, the chair says, my son, don't put your head in your hands. It looks like we're having a disaster of a game when you do things like that. He said, trust me, they're taking pictures right now of you. 
and I, I was just dying to just go like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we were losing at the time. I just wanted to go nuts, but I'm trying to control myself and, and people like me. I don't think should be put in positions I get put in, but I'm trying. That's the best way of saying it. <laughs> how, how much a part did the chairman have in getting your fight? Without the chairman, it wouldn't have happened. Simple as that, because without him, it would not have happened. Without him, I wouldn't have done the movie. Uh, when the movie people got in touch with me, no one knew anything about it, and he was the first person that I phoned. And I phoned him and said, Chairman, what am I going to do? Someone wants me to be in a movie. Stop winding me up, son. That <laughs> <laughs> was his first words, and I said, no, I'm being deadly serious. I thought it was a wind-up, but really it's not. And then Warner Brothers had spoken to him and, and things like that. Uh, he helped me with a solicitor and, and contracts and mad stuff that I wouldn't have a clue about. He's just helped me so much. I'm forever indebted to him, I really am. And he's a person who's looked out for me, looked after me, from a similar background and neighbourhood to I am, uh, I'd be lost without him. Goodison, you wouldn't believe how close it was to not happening. It was only through him, well, me whinging at him and phoning him all the time. <laughs> to four, I watched him pick up the phone one day and I, and I said to him, it's not going to happen. Everything's too late. We're running. We have to use a Sunday. And he said, don't worry, you've got my word, it's going to happen. And then it was only at that stage, with about seven or eight weeks to go, that I went, OK, sound, I'll focus on fighting. And that was it. I just focused on fighting. And the rest is history. I own every, or the, the greatest memory of me nice is down to him. It really is. And I think one thing we should praise him for is the 200,000 that uh, wow, the yeah. chairman and Everton Football Club <laughs> offered Sunday for the young boy. What a fantastic gesture that was from our football club. Mm. Well, I, you know what, funny enough, I spoke to him today and he said that it, he'd have paid the whole lot. <laughs> That's what the words were, I don't know, he said, I'd have paid the whole lot to get that kid that. So it, uh, it was unbelievable. That's all he needed left to make it up to get to what he needed to be. And it's just, he's an unbelievable person with a big heart. And you know what? I'm yet to meet a bigger Evertonian than him. He, he loves this club with everything that he's got. He, I just, I can't explain to you how much he loves Everton football. There's nothing he doesn't know about this club. I sit with him and kind of think I know a fair bit about Everton Football Club, but you're talking about a man who spent his whole life on that stand. I couldn't imagine the stresses he goes through, things like <laughs> transfer days and all them kind of things. I couldn't deal with it, I'll be honest. I I, I just strangle someone. I, I, says that, I said that to him. I, said, I, don't, I say to him, I don't know how you do it, you know, when he says, son, it's stressful. And I just say, you know, just strangle someone, it works for me. <laughs> It's the best advice. It's the only advice I can give you, and it's the best advice for me. So just strangle someone. Hopefully they can, you know, survive it or do something back. But strangulation works an awful lot. <laughs> Tony Bell, you teaching the chairman to box. There's a reality TV program in there somewhere, isn't there? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, these two lads are great friends of mine. They're great friends of yours and great friends of Everton Football Club. Snods and Bomber. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you everybody who turned up on the night. I can't thank.